welcome to AI Month. Started AI Month. Uh, lots happening across the month. We'll uh, we'll open up the mics a bit later in the in the session and um, get your input and feedback on your challenges. But uh, we've got some material to present first and get through that shortly. Look forward to hearing from everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm sure a few people will pop in as uh, as we get started. But we're here because we really want to help everyone kind of get practical get with practice. AI. And we're guessing that's why you guys joined. So great to see you all here. We we know that uh, many have started on the sort of chat GPT or AI journey in their organisations. But we just feel like there's just so much kind of discussion about tools and techniques, but no real kind of practical on the ground, you know, advice and discussion. So that's what we want to do today is just really kind of dive into how we think AI can help your organization and give you some practical, actionable advice to to get there. Um, it's not a whole lot different to rolling out any kind of initiative, uh, but there are some tips and tricks that we think will be valuable. So, um, yeah, it's not an, not an introductory session. It's it's getting into some more detail and really kind of getting under the under the hood uh, with how we can use ChatGPT in a business context at scale. And what we mean by at scale is it's not just one-to-one -one execution, it's company-wide and there's frameworks in place that let that happen safely and within the guidelines that you have in your business or in your operations. So we, uh, just to introduce ourselves, probably worth doing, just so you know who you're talking to. Um, Connor and I are partners in a software development agency called Connect. If you're wondering how to pronounce K-N-K-T, it's Connect, Connect Digital. Uh, we created Connect because we wanted to provide uh, a really kind of practical delivery focused Jacobson. service. And we've been in the AI space for a couple of years now, but last November is kind of where it hit, where the rubber hit the road and like things accelerated rapidly. And when ChatGPT first came out, I still remember the week, um, we jumped on it and yeah, just kind of had our minds blown like probably most of you did. And here we are 12 months later and- Done a couple of client projects and, um, you know, integrating ChatGPT and OpenAI into, into applications and, and workflows. Um, but yeah, it's been really exciting past 12 months, I think. So. Yeah, fast moving. So wait till the next 12 months. Um, in terms of what we do, I'm, I'm more strategy and kind of client solution focused uh, in the business. So I, I look after kind of client solutions and just client liaison. Um, Connor's the, the brains. Product, product engineer, product AI engineer. So I'm... Uh, I guess responsible for building everything and delivering it and making sure that we yeah, provide value to our clients. So that's brief intro on us. We're just going to jump into some um, content slides just to just to help step you through this and hopefully this works. We think um, we can be on the screen at the same time. So it's like that's working all right. Um, I think it's worth just giving a little bit of context on where we sit in the landscape with AI and with ChatGPT in particular, because, and the reason we want to do this is because um, it's just it's just nice to know kind of what's out there and, and where we sit and where ChatGPT sits in the, in the landscape. Yeah, so, I mean, AI is a very broad field um, and there's been AI around for, for ages now, um, but the move that, we're making is from what's called narrow AI, where it's really good at one specific task um, to more of a generalized intelligence. So artificial general intelligence is when it's at the same level as uh, you and I, as a human. Uh, we're not there quite yet, but um, generative AI uh, is what will likely get us there. Um, and this is where things like chat GPT and large language models fall under. So yeah, we won't dive into all the others, but 
when we talk about chat GPT, this is what we're we're referencing. Mm. From a business context, this is, uh, I think, a really important conversation to have for the reasons that we'll see in the next slide. Um, if you can just jump to that. Thanks, Connor. There's, um, there's this kind of growing growing awareness and usage of chat GPT in particular. And I'm not sure if you're aware, but it's the it's the fastest service ever to hit a million users. That happened in five days. Um, so, you know, the, the growth trajectory has been unbelievable and it's going to continue to go, uh, go that way. So one thing to really kind of be aware of is the generational kind of impetus or momentum that's happening here like i'm i'm a gen xer and you know i've got a bit of uh you know experience behind me when it comes to ai but the younger generations coming through that are going to that you're going to be interviewing in your organizations and hiring are uh, all across this stuff and increasingly so to the point where you know australians um there's sort of 50 over 50 percent you have used it for work of the survey respondents for this particular YouGov survey, uh, and that's going to only increase. So expect to have candidates knocking on your door in interviews who are all across, you know, right across ChatGPT and generative AI in, in general. Somewhere between three and five million Australian users, depending on the stats that you look at, every month. Um, that's out of 1.5 billion globally. So the numbers aren't insignificant and uh, as I've said, the trajectory that's increasing at is rapidly growing. So it's an important conversation to have for your teams as they bring the younger generation through and into those, because you know, we're already seeing developers, for example, um, using chat GPT in their everyday jobs and help them become more efficient and faster at what they do. So think about it in that context, you know, as per my email that hopefully most of you got, uh, earlier in the week, you know, there's this massive disruption happening. We're talking $400 billion worth of value in the Australian economy that's going to be rapidly disrupted by AI. So we're kind of at this crossroads where we need to understand the risks, but the opportunities are massive and that's what we're excited about and you know, helping organisations move from this kind of one-to-one -one experimental phase with it into a more scalable structured approach is what we're excited about because uh, I think that's where the gaps are in the conversation at the moment and it's really good to have um, have the opportunity to discuss this with you so thanks for joining. We do have a, a poll that we'd like to launch and we just want to get your take on how you're feeling about it like are you excited about AI or are you cautious about it or Kind of what's what's your feeling on it? So hopefully that poll's popped up. Um, just want to get your take on where you where you sit. You think it's too many risks to kind of get excited about, or are you excited about it? So if that's on your screen, just hands up if you can see that. Is that looking? Yep, cool. Thank you. I'll let that one run. Um, but yeah. it's worth worth talking about, and yeah, we'll, we'll chat about risks and risks and opportunity. Yeah, of course. With anything like this, there's always risks. Um, one of the biggest ones that uh, we hear a lot from clients, time and time again, is security and privacy. Uh, everyone wants to know where their data is going, what it's being used for, how much control they have over that. Um, and also another interesting one that came up recently was if ChatGPT tells one of my staff members to do something and they do it and then there's uh, legal consequences or damages or or an issue arises who's responsible for that um and the answer is not entirely sure right now it's a you know emerging field and it always depends um but yeah it's good to kick off the conversation and, and be aware of all this stuff um compliance and data accuracy as well you've got to remember that these large language models, um, they're trained to predict the next word, the best next word that comes up. So sometimes they can sound really smart and that's what they're trained to do, but the uh, it might not be 100% accurate or reliable. So, 
and then of course integration complexities so um, you know this is where the power comes from these models when you can integrate with your own data and your own platforms but uh, there are risks that come with that one of the big ones is cultural alignment that needs to be thought about like a, I'm just looking at the poll results here we've got you know 67 percent who are excited and some in the middle looks like that's growing um, you know, what, what do we do here? Risks and opportunity kind of in the middle. But if we're excited, if this group here is excited, you know, when you go back into your workplace, there's probably not going to be, uh, everyone's probably not going to be excited. So how do, how do we tackle that? And the cultural alignment factor, I think, is really important. Just being part of a couple of CSIRO webinars across the last few weeks, they've been talking about transparency and just letting people know at a basic level that how AI is being used and, and where it's being used and to do what is really important. Like keep those, keep those transparency levels up, but just think about and be sympathetic to staff reactions and what they think about it impacting on their jobs and be sensitive to that. So that's one of the risks. Um, but the opportunities, you know, we believe far outweigh that. So we want to mention those, but, you know, the opportunity is, as as we see it, is really blending the creativity of us as humans with the precision of AI. And that's got immediate value to it. Like you can be faster, you can be more accurate, you can consume more data and more information at scale. Yeah. And over time, this will become more and more of a competitive advantage for companies as they roll this out and start to adopt it. Um, those that don't will just be left behind. Um, but if you do and you and you do it right, you can really build up and start to compound into this you know, real uh, strategic asset in a sense for the business. Our next slide shows how we see the continuum of AI maturity. And it'd be good to get your feedback on that. We've got a poll that we'll release in a second, but just to explain our thinking here, we, we see you know, on, on a scale of one to 10, You've got emerging where it's one-to-one -one chat GPT usage and it's it's very unstrategic, it's unstructured, all the way through to where AI is embedded in the business and is helping them do some remarkable things. We put that at the sort of level 10. In between, you've got what we call progressive where things are starting to get formalised. There's strategic thinking around it, management understands it, and there's a process in play where it's being scaled out in a in a methodical way and it'd be good to understand sort of where everyone's at on that scale we're finding most businesses that we deal with are in the kind of one to five bracket a couple are starting to kind of push through into the next barrier where they're or next phase where they're getting into transformative um a transformative um version of their business so we're just going to release that um release that poll and there's three options. You may be in between one and five, but kind of pick one, and we'd like to see um, like to see what that looks like. Happy to share this deck after too. You um, you better read through it at your leisure. But you know, a mature business really is has picked it up and has got formal procedures in place and a process in place that will that will take you through. So. We want to we want to talk to you now just about how we can make how you can make chat gpt a strategic asset not just this experimental thing in your business that um that is a little bit nebulous and unstructured so when we when we think about um the roadmap the roadmap of of, of rolling out ai in your business isn't that different to what any consultant would put in front of you you know, right, the, the kind of steps that you take. But we think there's a couple of details here that are really important to understand and we want to explore some of those now because, you know, we all know that um, collaboration and literacy and all those kind of expressions are, are part of the course. But AI in the, in the, in the you know, kind of nascent period of rolling out AI in your business, like literacy is really important and taking your teams through that literacy and kind of exploration process is really important. But we're presuming that you've already started on that journey and we're focusing on how we can scale out chat gpt with guardrails 
for example, like guardrails are the security and data um, parameters, the guardrails that you put in place that let you scale it out safely. So we've, you know, we're expecting that you're probably moved on from experimenting. You've got your head around it. You know what it's capable of. But how do we now tackle that from a, an organisation wide scale? And then, as we said in the previous slide, the the collaboration and investment sort of part of that process is really for more mature businesses as they have got a handle on how AI is improving their business. So using an example, if you, and, and we believe any AI initiative needs to be aligned with your strategy. If, you're, if, if one of your strategic imperatives was to improve customer satisfaction and you wanted to improve customer satisfaction by say 30%, but you know you've got this endless list of customer issues to deal with and your team's maxed out and they're understaffed and you're just under-resourced. Like, how do you deal with that? Well, we think the best way to deal with it is with a framework. And frameworks just help you think something through and tackle something in a logical way for a logical outcome. And the framework that we use uncovers the need, like helps you understand the need. Have we frozen, Connor? Looks like we've frozen. Sorry, it just looks like there's a bit of a technical glitch here. Is that looking? Might just be your computer. Yeah, okay, cool. Hopefully it is. Thumbs up if it's all good. Cool, thank you. Um, you know, we need to uncover the need, like, like let's figure out why our customer service staff have got such high tickets, uh, high, high ticket, high volumes of tickets and long response times. And let's start to work through, um, understanding that and figuring out what the objectives are and then getting into some detail around the actual AI tools that you can use to solve those problems. So we'd like to just talk that through from a, um, you know, from a, um, from a framework perspective, like how you can look at a need or a problem in your business, in your organization, and think about it in the language of AI. Yeah, so there's a couple of different um, criteria uh, when assessing uh, each kind of business area. Um, so we've got a bit of a diagram here and some of the key ones to look at is whether it's really data intensive, um, if there's a requirement for language understanding, uh, repetitive tasks and personalized responses. Um, so it's just a couple of examples there around what uh, business areas usually fall into the, the end of those uh, workflows there. And, and if it's green, it's usually uh, good for a use case like ChatGPT. Um, and you may need to extend that into a compliance or a legal conversation as well. So you know, there's a there's a framework here for evaluating you know, the need within that particular business area around data data accuracy. You know what happens if you do get inaccurate information from ChatGPT? Um, is there regulations that need to be complied? with and is there some sort of legal implications to that to, to that data so you know privacy kind of mentioned privacy earlier um and pii uh, publicly uh, identifiable information like how do you tackle that and is that part of this flow if your customer uh, experience use case demands that you think about pii then that needs to be part of your consideration set but you can see there's um, there's a couple of red flags in this particular workflow or framework here where chat GPT isn't suitable because of it doesn't it, it just doesn't tick those boxes. So this 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 framework here is all about understanding how safe or unsafe it is to use chat GPT in that instance. If it's unsafe, there's decisions that need to be made. So the lesson really here is think through the problem understand the workflow, and then think through the implications around the outputs of ChatGPT. And then that'll help you drill into the actual tactics that you use to, uh, to solve that. <clears throat> um, 
one of the, I guess, follow on um, activities from this is to just think about your objectives. Like, like what do we need to achieve by rolling out AI? If your strategy is to increase customer satisfaction by 30%, uh, your objective might be to reduce response times and introduce self-service for your customers and that therefore reduce the time that, ta that, that staff spend on that. So you think about your objectives and then it's drilling into, you know, how AI can solve those as a, as a next step. And that's really where the use cases come in. So here we've got a use case for a, uh, for a customer support flow. Um, if it's got high, high inquiry volume, then it's logical that you need to start thinking about how uh, how AI can solve repetitive queries. If it doesn't involve repetitive queries, let's think about staff training. If it does and you need 24-7 support, that's a great use case for a chat GPT enabled bot, for example. So that decision tree just helps you map, map out um, the particular use case and get into some more detail around when or when you shouldn't use it, when you should or when you shouldn't use it. Um, multilingual is a classic one. You know, do we need to deploy a multilingual chat GPT to, to answer those multilingual queries? If not, potentially a different tactic can be used there. So that that framework where you go, you know, let's let's look at the problem and let's identify the need. Let's figure out kind of what the metrics are around that. And then let's look at a, a use case like we have here is a is a really sort of logical way to approach any project, let alone an AI enabled project. We're not going to really drill into you know cost benefit analysis and ROI discussions. That's a pretty big topic, and we can um, you know we can answer any questions outside of the webinar, or if it comes up in um, in a Q and A at the end, we can we can tackle it then. But it's really important just to think about the value of the benefit versus the cost of getting it wrong. I think like that's that's a really important point to make. Like what happens if you get it wrong? And is the risk of doing so, does that outweigh the process to go through that and actually figure out what it needs to do to get it right? Cool. So on to the, uh, the interesting stuff. So we've got, uh, some practical examples and options that you can use. So essentially, once you've arrived at the output that you need to use ChatGPT or you could use ChatGPT, um, and you're looking for ways to scale that out across your organization, um, what do you have at your disposal? So we've got a uh, bit of a high level options matrix here. Um, we've got two axes here. We've got uh, complexity. Um, down the bottom, we've got, uh, sorry, to the left, we've got less com complex use cases. Um, and it's not just in terms of the use case, but also what it takes to roll it out um, and develop that. And then to the right, we've got more complex examples. And then security as well. So um, security in the sense of your data, but also uh, how much control you have over uh, the solution uh, when you roll it out to a larger organization. So at a, at a high level, we've got, um, we'll, we'll dive into these a little bit more, but a prompt library, which is just kind of copy pasting prompts back into chat GPT. Uh, that's super easy to do, but not as secure. And then all the way, um, on the other end of the spectrum is self-hosting these models. So you have complete end-to-end -end control over the data and privacy. So diving into the prompt library, this is essentially uh, a central repository and location for uh, prompts specific to your company. So you can just share this page, whether it's a Notion doc or a you know, Google doc and or you can just copy paste these into chat GPT uh, to use when, when they see fit. And you'll probably build that out and make that a collaborative process as well. So when people come across good prompts or they figure out a way, um, a good, good way to do it, they can just paste it in there. Um, and this would be really good for smaller size companies. Um, 
helping educate staff as well on how to use this and, and see it as more of a tool and just improve the response and, and quality of uh, ChatGPT's answers. So um, another interesting one there, for example, is if you add the kind of quoted it down there, let's work this out in a step-by-step -step way to be sure we have the right answer. If you add that at the end of your question to ChatGPT, it perform, performs much better um, at arriving at the right answer or, or producing a much uh, higher quality response. Um, and I think after this, if you want to go try that out, it's pretty, pretty cool to see. Um, and then, yeah, another uh, resource there, which you could share with people about understanding how these prompts work. So we're talking about level one of scale here, are we? Most basic scale. Yeah, yeah. But still not many guardrails, right? Next option here, which um, starts to provide more structure uh, is custom GPTs. So this was actually just released last week from OpenAI and allows you to build customizable chatbots essentially, which you can share with staff and other employees. Um, and it allows you to add some kind of domain knowledge, uh, whether that's PDFs or Word docs um, and instructions and, and more guide rails for the chatbot. Um, and then you can roll that out and share it with, with everyone. So some examples there could be creating a first time manager assistant for uh, first time managers and you can upload some uh, resources there with, with the doc. Um, triaging uh, procurement requests. So you can help people put that together. You could let the AI search for some you know, alternatives and, and do up the cost analysis. And then you can use actions to then maybe send that to the procurement team in a formatted way, but it helps guide employees through that process. Um, so yeah, there's a couple of, couple of different options there and it's pretty cool to, to play around with that one. And then another one is ChatGPT Enterprise. So this is the enterprise offering from OpenAI around ChatGPT. Now it still is that chat-like interface and doesn't have as much guide rails, but has a lot better security and data privacy. So they're SOC 2 compliant. Uh, they don't use any of your data for training the models and if you're a larger organization, this is probably what you would go for because it provides more admin control, uh, allows you to have more observability around who's using it, how much they're using it, have these admin level settings, um, but still not as much uh, control, but, but good to scale it out. And the third, or Another option, um, which I mentioned before, was self-hosting. So we have ChatGPT, which is closed source, but there are open source models, which essentially means that the code is out there available for everyone to use, and you can then self-host those um, and then roll that out and, and give that as a tool for employees. But that would mean um, you're able to own that data from end to end. So you could host that on your own premise or in your own cloud instance um, and this is really good if you're dealing with really sensitive data or you have certain requirements as an organization to control that um, but also if you have the resources behind you and a team behind you to deploy that and manage it and set it up and maintain that so some examples down there um, of open source models that could be used are gbt for all there's llama 2 by meta and then another one called Falcon. And then finally, we've got a custom platform or a custom build. And this is essentially building out a workflow specific platform for your business um, and integrating chat GPT and these um, tools into that, that process. Um, and this is this is really good to start to abstract away 
some of the complexities that come with this technology. Um, and it's much more customizable and flexible uh, for, for specific workflows when it really starts to, uh, you, you really need that guidance. Um, or for example, if you need structured data um, and you need the same response or the same format of response every single time, or if you're needing to give the same um, inputs every single time. So it's when chat may not be the right interface anymore, but um, you, the, the technology of a large language model is still really useful. And as Stuart mentioned previously, it's where the value of this technology is really high, but the risk of getting it wrong is almost higher. Um, so this is when we start to look at these sorts of options. Nice. I think there's, in terms of getting your heads around kind of timeline to value here, it's kind of the, the first couple of options are literally days. You know, you can get that done in days or weeks. Um, and as you, as we progress through those slides there, it becomes months and, you know, you start to get into the custom platform side of things that can be, you know, more, a, a more of a sort of a, a significant time and money investment, but um, it's all about the journey and it's about starting on that journey. We, we want to show you a couple of examples uh, when it comes to thinking about a custom platform and, and what that looks like. Um, we, we've done a project for uh, an NDIS. It was an NDIS based project where we helped, um, we helped occupational therapists spend less time on reporting. And as you can imagine, with health data, there's a real, there's a there's a, a heavy need for PII, personal identifiable information, to be dealt with in that framework. But the thing, and here's a here's a kind of top line um, diagram that shows the components of that solution of that custom solution. And you can see ChatGPT on the right hand side is really just one component of the solution. So you think about the business processes that you have, how you can codify those, but bring chat GPT into them. And we we built a platform called Use Cloak, which redacts any data going out to chat GPT. So it's anonymous and then it unredacts it and then it presents it back to the user. So that's how we tackled that one. And that's got some model training in it. Um, there's a whole raft of features around sort of you know, formatting the reports that come in and uh, a template based approach that can be used across different uh, disciplines or you know, applications within the health space. But that's that's how that's how chat GPT can fit into a custom application to solve that particular problem. And then there's a whole you know, there's going to be a whole bunch of material uh, to reference for the model to then reference going forward. This is a good example of um, where we want that structured uh, output it's still personalized it's still customized for each uh, client uh, but the inputs are always generally going to be in the same format and we want the report to be the same format um, coming out so I think that was a pretty pretty cool one to see I think an average port report took eight hours to generate without chat GPT without this and we cut that down to about 15 to 20 minutes once this was rolled out with the with the strategic imperative of spending more time with clients, it's like like why spend more time reporting than what you do mm -hmm. talking to talking to clients about how you can help them solve their problems. This one here is another level uh, to give you an idea of how a business system can be expanded. And this one here is about reviewing documents for compliance in the in the Australian financial sector. So. Uh, you know, this has got inputs from, you know, different parties that, that put their data, all their fact finding, all their research into a particular framework. And then there's policies and there's ASIC documents. There's a whole raft of material, reference material that we need to kind of present to AI and combine them with the response. So, there's a, there's a process behind this that is kind of next level when it comes to just starting to segment um, the process that 
a document or some data has to go through to then feed into chat GPT. And um, yeah, this one's been a, a really, I guess, a, a showcase project in the sense that, you know, we had to pivot it halfway through. We, we started building it um, three months in. It's like, oh, there's a new technology and now we can do this, this and this. And then um, you had to, you know, we had to kind of pivot and, and essentially rebuild it because of the, the latest technology that came out. So that was a really interesting one. And it kind of highlighted the need for your organizations to be on board with that process. So it's not a typical software project where, where you might have a large, you know, scope written up front and that takes three months to write. It's like, hang on, we've just finished writing the scope and the text changed. Mm -hmm. It's going to, how do you deal with that? So having the right mindset when it comes to AI powered projects is really important. You need to get whoever's involved in that project, uh, all your stakeholders, they need to be comfortable with that kind of approach because you're not tackling, um, you're not tackling a problem in a, in a certain environment. You're building in a changing landscape. It's fast, fast moving technology. Yeah, and I think some of the other interesting lessons from that, um, from doing these projects is to not treat it like a black box where it's just this magic thing where you, you know, you give it all the content and then a, a magic report comes out or, or response comes out. Uh, we found it's worked best once um, the employees start to see how the AI thinks and uh, can get better feedback um, from that. Because once you start to get an understanding, um, yeah, it's much easier for them to see where things are going right or see where things are going wrong. And then with that feedback, you can train the AI or uh, change the prompts better and then start to, to really build out um, a more valuable asset for the business so and just try and try and break your projects up into small tangible chunks like don't don't tackle you know five different departments at once like tackle one department or a problem within within one department uh, to start with and figure out your process get your frameworks in place and then grow from there like like don't think you can uh, bite off more than what you can chew because you know, like our, our methodology is called sprint and deliver. We just do smaller sprints and we deliver value. And then as Connor said, like people start to get their hands on it and they can see how this can work and then have, have input into the outcome. Um, and defining your problem as clearly as you can is, is a real key part of that. Because if you um, engage with an agency like us or any other provider, it's like the clearer you are at briefing in the problem, the easier it is for us to solve it. So you, know, you understanding your problems really well and just deconstructing those and then briefing us in makes that process a lot, a lot smoother. So trying to find the actual problem, you know, it's like the old kind of ask five whys, like why is it doing this? And then you get an answer. It's like, why is it doing that? And then like do that five times and you're probably getting close. Think about it in that way. And also building with scale and and a long-term outlook as well and just being on on top of the changing landscape uh you know, things moving at a, a really rapid pace i mean we had to add something else into this webinar last minute just because of uh the new release from open ai like there's all these cool new changes and, and really valuable changes coming out uh every week and it's yeah you need to to stay on top of that um and when you're building these workflows or processes or or rolling something out just keep that in mind that things are likely going to change in the future and so building it in a way that you can swap out things or, or, or change it really easily scales are so important um, think about you know or, or understand how you can turn the tap on so if your business gets hold of this and then people really kind of get on board and buy into it they're going to want to go so be ready for that be ready for that scale and be you know, be prepared to um, to turn the tap on when they do. So, yeah, it's 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 pretty exciting times. Um, it's challenging from a um, you know from a development perspective, but the opportunity to really help businesses and organisations transform is what we're really excited about. So, 
we hope that was we hope that was useful. Um, we're almost forty five minutes in, so we want to kind of switch across to um, a Q and A. Just the results on that poll from before in terms of AI maturity. Most of you are in the emerging space. Um, a couple are in level five, so progressive, which is awesome to hear. It'd be great to get your input or your um, advice for the rest of the the rest of the team here. And a couple are at level ten, which is sensational. So um, love to hear from from those people who are who are with us today. What we'll do now is open it up to open it up to. Um, Q and A. How do I do that? Q and A. How do we open mics though? Sorry, team. We're just going to figure this out. I think people can probably unmute if they want to. How's that for a revolutionary idea? <laughs> DIY unmute. Hopefully you can unmute yourselves and ask away. Or if you've got a if you've got a particular story where you've been through this process and can give us some advice and help everyone understand what you've learned, that'd be awesome. Happy to jump in with the first question. Um, I'm Sarah Jacobson. I'm a director of knowledge management at Minter Ellison, which is a large um, Australian law Sarah, firm. Sarah, I can I can see your lips moving, but we can't hear you for some reason. All right. Second. Hang on. I can hear you. Someone else can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you as well, Sarah. Can. Can you hear oh, any of us? Yeah, yep. there we go. Sorry, we had we had some settings at our end. Okay. Way. We got you. Thanks. No problem. Um, I was just saying that um, I'm the Director of Knowledge Management at Minter Ellison, which is a large Australian law firm. Um, and I guess my question is, um, are we taking a pretty, you know, a, I wouldn't say aggressive, but leading um, approach towards AI and we're doing a lot of, um, you know, looking at building things ourselves. Um, also looking at what's out there to buy, um, working with partners, you know, sort of every every avenue. But one of the questions that I have and, and you know, coming out of the open AI announcement on GPTs earlier this week or last week when it, which probably put a whole ton of startups out of business is how do you kind of position, how would you recommend that, you know, any organisation positions itself where um, it's still experimenting, it's still doing things, building things, but it's not putting itself in a position where, you know, we go and build something internally and within five minutes, somebody else builds something that's bigger and better. Um, I guess that's sort of one of the things I'm grappling with at the moment is what do we do ourselves and where do we where do we partner and where do we sit back and wait because we know that somebody will do something in that space. Mm. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's like, do we or don't we go? And I, I think uh, part of the solution or part of the part of the answer to that is, um, you know, what are your biggest problems? And if you can if you can solve those problems as as quickly as kind of reasonably possible. If you said, okay, we've got this burning issue and it involves this particular, maybe it's manual data entry and AI can solve that within three months, like I'd say, go for it. And yeah, things are going to change more than likely within three months, but at least you're on the way and, you know, try and minimise the risk by minimising the amount of money you spend on that by putting a, a time box on it. Um, Bigger projects, yeah, that's that's something that you just just have to go. Well, at some point we need to move, and in a year's time we're going to look back and go that was such a, you know, waste of money or waste of time because it's moving so fast. And I just think if you if you sit on the sidelines and always wait for the right tech, I think that's missing the opportunities, particularly for the quick wins in solving problems in your business. So I think it's almost like the kind of how 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 much of a burning issue is this problem and how fast can we solve it and then figure out where in that matrix it sits to then tackle those things first. I would also look at the medium that the problem is in, as in, you know, is chat 
going to be the right interface for that. If so, then it's more than likely chat GPT and open AI are going to continue to release that and make that better. So it might not be worth going to another chat provider or another chat system. Um, but in the, in the, in the two examples we provided where it was NDIS reporting and financial compliance review, though like, like open AI probably won't go into those specific, uh, domains in that medium. Um, they're not going to build a, uh, NDIS reporting platform. So being able to find that, that, that line between, um, using the technology and, and making sure that what they're going to continue to evolve and, and improve that you can keep integrating that into it, um, versus the, uh, the more structured part, which likely won't be on their roadmap. That's, that's what I try to work out. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. The other, the other, um, bit of advice I think is, uh, you can still build technology. You can still build a technology layer or a te technology solution and switch out, for example, the LLM that it uses. So if you, if you wanted to halfway through the project, bring, uh, bring an LLM into the business and have that self hosted for privacy reasons. And for all the reasons I, you fully appreciate, you can do that. And you, the technology can be kind of loosely coupled with the LLM, but not necessarily rely on that. So you can switch it out. Just yeah, keep that in mind as well when you come to um, yeah, kind of thinking about how you build it. Thank you. Any other any other questions on what we covered or what you're thinking about? Be great to be great to hear from those level five, level 10 organizations, if you're in the room, don't be shy. Um, my name is uh, Faisal Mansour and I work for Department of Education. Um, and I was just curious to know about, is was there any situation um, where you came across um, data quality issues? And if so, how did you address those? Um, because there's a large data state, state normally, you know, in government organizations, and there's a lot of um, quality and duplication, and um, you know, you name it. Um, there are a lot of issues. So, how how do you go about those fixing? Uh, probably both have got something to to contribute to that from past experience, but um, you know, the the old adage of garbage in, garbage out rings true. It's like try and try and tackle that and use AI to tackle that. Um, there's there's tactics that you can use or techniques that you can use to clean up your data, clean up unstructured data to a large extent, but it sounds like you're still going to have to tackle that before you can start to you know, feed that data into an AI based or an AI powered system um, is the long and short of it. But if you can if you can at least find you know, where those kind of nuggets are in that data and build on that rather than try and embrace all data. I think that's that's really kind of your only choice. It's like um, AI can't solve a, th the problem of messy data to the extent that you probably hope, I, I wouldn't have thought, unless there's patterns that it can identify that you can then feed your data into and, and it'll help you solve those. Thanks. Don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but um, yeah, it's it's a pretty tough scenario when you've got um, sort of legacy systems in your in your environment that you need to deal with. But again, I think it's kind of try and break it down into some kind of focus area rather than the the, the bigger problem. Like if there's if there's an area where you've got some data that's reliable, start there, prove it out and get people on board with that to then go, okay, let's resource the bigger opportunity or the bigger task of uh, cleaning your data, structuring it correctly, and then moving forward. But as always, yeah, there's when you've got legacy systems, it's tough. And then you have to go back to the source and go, how do we fix that? So 
can be a bit of a um, an endless trail, unfortunately. But start small. Try and start yeah. small. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Another question related, I guess. Um, so we talked about legacy systems. What about legacy culture? So we've got you know a lot of dominance on okay, this is my domain. You can't touch the data, um, or application itself very complicated um, and kind of you know relying on multiple data sources. Um, sitting on multiple locations. Um, so how then we can address in a best way the people um, and then data itself and the process, so to speak, because it's going to change process as well. Um, people are quite, um, um, you know, um, nervous about that because they're not clear what it's going to do and how it's going to impact their own job. Um, so, anything that similar that you came across? Yeah, um, not just in AI, right? It's like in any in any kind of change management process. Um, and I just, yeah, my, like my advice would be, um, it comes down to human nature and try and tackle it at that level. It's like what's in it for them, and if you can, as much as possible, kind of individualize that that message. Where it's like it's not necessarily about well it's not about taking your job it's about helping you do more getting finding more value in your work and in your role you know if you can kind of try and target that message to your staff and your team and, and get them on board in that way then you know it's it's not about the technology replacing them it's about helping them be better at what they do and more effective at what they do and i think um you know Proving it out with with some experiments and some use cases is probably the best way to do that. But um, involving them in yeah. the process as well, um, you know, we found when we've had to do custom projects, the more people that we can involve in that and c to contribute, and then they get to see the the end outcome of that and and get to learn about it and see the power of it. Um, they can see it's almost a result of their input, uh, so they, they buy in a bit more. Um, but yeah, I think it's more about, it's definitely about letting them see the power of, of AI and all these new technologies. Um, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Um, and I have the same approach. Um, I get there is another factor to it, and this is winning the uh, support from the C-level management, um, especially, you know, the chief uh, CIO and CFO, because it's all about it's all falls back to dollar and you know what like how much dollar we're going to spend and how is going to benefit us in terms of again dollar or reputation or whatever it is so and i've seen a uh, lack of support like just one business unit or line of business just jumps into some idea which is great and um there's kind of friction or there is kind of not enough support from the senior management and there's a number of amount you know a number of um a uh, dollar figure spent and then the the project goes down to the drain so which is quite you know waste of time and money mm. yeah yeah it's um comes down to value kind of value to the organization in terms of dollar value or you know less less customer churn or you know bottom line what like it's you're right it's it's kind of translating it back to those to those value drivers in the business that um, can be tough sometimes, particularly if, if it's unknown, right? People are scared of what they don't know. So, yeah. Thank you. We've got um, got a couple of minutes left in the meeting, so um, happy to take one more question if there is one. And um, yeah, it's um, it's been great having you all on here. And what we'll do is we'll like we'll share. Um, we'll share the deck out to you all and welcome any any other questions. So, so, uh, so I've got I've got a question for you. It's probably a bit more of a technical question. Yep. Um, uh, big amounts of data because you've only got certain token sizes that can be um, manipulated or used within within ChatGPT. Token size in um, in GPT four Turbo is significantly larger than what it was before. But still, it, it's not that big when it, when you're dealing with large, large data. And I guess a, a good example is the example that we've got with the education 
department here in the meeting is that they're dealing with massive amounts of data. And if you're limited by token sizes, then um, you can't process all that data. You're going to hit your head on the ceiling. Mm. Um, so I'd be interested in, um, I guess, what strategies or what what uh, techniques you would use to get around that that limitation with AI. Good question. Yeah, for, for something like that, um, two things that pop into my mind are the code interpreter from OpenAI, which instead of yeah, but, you know, but, pasting in but the again, entire, sorry. But, but that again, like, so if you're dealing with the education department, right, uh, you can't you can't take all of that data and put it into code interpreter. I think this is probably more so a, an open AI API type mm. strategy, and um, and I think you know, and, and so I'm just wondering how how you tackle that. Yeah, I think because um, you, you, you can't take the database of the education department and put it into mm. into code interpreter. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, in, in that instance, I'd probably look at using their function calling. Um, so you can almost give the AI the tools to query that data or use the AI to generate the queries um, that would do the analysis, but not essentially do the analysis inside chat GPT. Um, so yeah, that would be that would be where I'd where I'd start. Thank you. We've done some work, Edward, around kind of breaking down you know, any kind of data into smaller chunks and sort of proceduralize it. So, um, you know, there's ways that you can do that. But again, it's like, yeah, we're not talking about a, a database like theirs, um, which would be enormous. So thinking that through would be an interesting challenge. Well, I know that we, I mean, we've been using uh, a bit of LangChain with graphical GLs to chunk down data in, into into bite-sized chunks. And I'd be interested whether or not you feel that that would actually work. I don't know if you've used that yourself, but if that, we haven't found the limit yet. And it'd be, I'd be curious to know whether or not it can, if it can actually handle a database of that size. Like I would like to find the limit. But I haven't I haven't found it yet. I didn't know if you had some insight. Mm, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely I'd definitely look into the or, or focus on the the function calling. I think that's where whenever we run into issues or um, you know haven't been able to give it all the context, we've just given it the the tools to query that, yeah, sure. um, and then. Yeah, we, we've 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 done some chunking and sentiment like search in a sense, like vectorizing documents um, to get the the relevant part, um, which in the end wasn't actually that useful. And we found that just a simple um, categorization of the document sections worked better. Um, so yeah, taking it back to basics can sometimes help. Yeah, of course. Perfect. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, thanks, Edward. Thank you. That's um, that's a wrap. We'll um, leave it there. We're spot on our hour. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your participation. And yeah, thanks for thanks for being here. It's um, it's been good to see so many faces. We've uh, we've released another one. If you'd like to um, like to jump onto that on the thirtieth, it's on the CSIRO website. So check that out. Uh, and we've got some. Web, uh, webinars and courses if you need your team to need to upskill your team so reach out if you need to uh, need to explore that option but yeah thanks all enjoy the rest of your day thank you thank you jeff thanks